Hey guys, I have another one of my recent games that I'd like to analyze today. And as per the title, it involves some interesting positions that involve checks, captures, and attacks, which are all uh, moves that we need to be in tune with as chess players. So there's going to, when we come to some interesting spots in the game, I will ask you guys to possibly pause the video and think of some ideas before I play them out in, in the game. And um, as always, I will be analyzing all the moves that both sides make, giving my thought process and just my ideas on um, certain moves throughout the game. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to remind you to please like and subscribe if you guys enjoy my videos. Okay, so let's start. I'm playing with the black pieces here, and white plays e4, e5, and white plays f4, and this is known as the king's gambit. I don't know if I've mentioned this in any of my previous videos, but a gambit opening always involves a, a player sacrificing a pawn, at least, uh, to gain some advantage in the game. So typically that advantage is realized as very quick development or early control of the center, or possibly putting your opponent's king in a weakened position in the beginning of the game. Sometimes gambits involve sacrificing multiple pawns. Sometimes they even involve sacrificing entire pieces in the beginning. Um, it just depends on the type of gambit. So what's way more popular than the king's gambit is actually the queen's gambit, which is d4, c4. It's called the queen's gambit because they're the queen's pawns on the queen's side. This is called the king's gambit because e4 and f4 are the king's pawns. So I don't see this opening very often, and I actually didn't and don't really. Well, I've learned, but I did not know really how to handle this opening or how to prepare for this. Um, my thought process here was I didn't want to take this pawn because I figure if my opponent's playing the king's gambit, he probably knows how to play. Um, if I capture this, because that's probably the most common move. So I didn't want to play into his preparation, essentially. So I played d6, just supporting my pawn. He plays knight f3, attacking my e5 pawn a second time, and I defend. And he plays c3 here. So when I saw this, I said, okay, he's preparing d5, which is basically adding another attacker onto my e5 pawn. And one move I thought that might help counteract that would be bishop to g4. Uh, my idea here is I'm just pinning this knight, so he's no longer really attacking this pawn. This is a bit of a dangerous move for black because obviously this bishop is undefended, so you got to make sure you keep uh, your eye on him and pay attention to him um, as this game progresses. But okay, so my opponent does not play d4 yet. He plays bishop to c4. And I noticed that he's attacking this weak f, uh, f7 pawn, which I've talked about a little bit in previous videos. The other thing I noticed was because he ha now has a pawn on f4, he is anchoring or supporting this knight jump over to this square. So typically, if this pawn wasn't here, my queen would be able to capture a knight uh, that goes to this square. But since this pawn's here, um, I have to watch out for this move. So... To defend against that, I play h6. I don't want this knight coming here. Um, I think in hindsight, this is probably kind of a slow move, uh, especially considering the state of this game, considering oops, considering um, the amount of pressure he already has on the center. I feel like he's already got a, a strong pawn center here, and this is not really helping me get a uh, fight for any control over the center. So this is probably a mistake move. What I probably should have done was capture this pawn right now. Uh, that removes the defender of his square, so he wouldn't be able to play that knight move right away. But h6 is the move I played. And now he plays d4. And this wall of pawns here is a pretty scary sight for me. Um, he's got really great center influence, and this is just a scary pawn structure here. Pawn wall here. And... Um, I have to find a way to kind of chip away against this. The only thing I will notice, well, that I'll say here, is that he still has to get his king um, out of the way before he starts opening up the center with his pawns. So, wink, wink, that might be something that we'll be talking about in a little bit. Okay. So, I wanted to chip away at this pawn, this middle pawn structure. I noticed that if I capture 
on f4 now. I'm kind of just helping his development. He will just recapture with the bishop. He's going to bring another piece into the game, into the center, and that's not something I wanted to do. So instead of capturing the f-pawn, I capture the d-pawn, realizing that, yes, he is recapturing with another pawn in the center, but to me, that was worth the, that was better than the other alternative there. So I see he has this three pawn wall still, and I my thought process is okay. He's probably going to play e5 next. This pawn push is supported by these two pawns on d4 and f4. So I play queen e7 here. Seems like kind of a weird move to make, um, but I have a potential tactic moving forward depending on his next move. And I'm also preparing castling long here with my king and my rook here. So he does play e5, which is the move I suspected. So now might be a good time to pause the video in a second or two to try to see or figure out a potential tactic I have here to win a, a potentially a piece. Um, so one of the things we're taught to do as chess players is always look for undefended pieces in your opponent's position and also in your own position. So you scan the board, um, notice undefended pieces that your opponent has, and once you, the trick is once you find those pieces, try to see if there's a way you can exploit that. Try to see if there's a tactic you can use um, that could potentially exploit that undefended piece. Okay, so I would suggest pausing the video here and trying to find uh, the tactic that I that I used in a moment. Okay, so the move I play here is he captures on e5. The undefended piece that I scanned and noticed was this bishop right here on c4. It's got nobody defending it. And more than that, I noticed that his king is still vulnerable here. So as soon as I move this d6 pawn out of the way, I'm creating an avenue to check my opponent's king. So I capture the pawn here. And he recaptures, and I continue with this tactic. So I played queen to b4 check. And you should probably pause the video again in a second, because there is one move, there's a decent move white can play here that actually blocks this check and also basically makes it so they're not actually losing a piece. The move that I suspected him to play. So... Go ahead and pause the video again, or think about it really quick. See if you can find the, the only decent move for white here. Okay, so the move I was expecting him to play was knight to d2. This blocks my check, and it's also defending this bishop, which, which was hanging um, on the last move. So that's what I was expecting, and what I was expecting to do from there was castling queenside. Notice that because he moves this knight here, that's the only reason I can castle, because he's blocking his own queen's scope down this file here. So what I was expecting was for this to happen, for me to castle, and I guess let's say white castles here. Rook can take this, this knight, and when he recaptures with either his queen or his bishop, I win this bishop as well. So I'm basically trading... Um, a rook for two pieces, which is a pretty good trade, which is a good trade. And next move, well, first of all, I'm attacking this rook, but for now his king's defending. But I have this other bishop to c5 move here, checking the king. So this would be a pretty good position for me. And that was what I was expecting. But instead of that move, my opponent actually plays knight c3. So the problem here is that his bishop's hanging, so... I'm going to take that bishop, and I'm up a piece. Okay. So here he plays bishop d2. Again, he's blocking his queen with his own bishop, so he gives me the ability to castle now, queenside, which is already what I want, because my rook now is lined up with his queen. So that's just a generally a good, a good thing to have happen in a game. Okay. So he plays queen e2 here, which is a pretty strange-looking move at first. Um, so typically in the chess game, you don't really want to trade pieces if you're losing, which white is losing here. Um, I guess the reasoning for that would be being up a piece when there's all these pieces on the board is good. 
being up a piece when there are no other pieces on the board is just winning. Um, this is helping me simplify and kind of take my advantage into the end of the game. So I would love to trade here. I think probably the reason why he made this move is he still can't castle because I'm actually blocking his castling on this side. And he can't castle this side either unless he moves his queen. So he could move his queen here, I guess, but I guess he was trying to give his uh, king some breathing room, and that was his strategy, but I'm going to take that piece. I'm going to take that queen and simplify this game being ahead of a piece at this moment. So I go ahead and do that. He takes up his knight, and now I I see the next couple moves I make are just simply simplifying moves. Um, I'm attacking this knight already. I'm, I'm I'm just making moves that are basically simplifying the board for me and trying to get into the end of the game with the advantage that I created from that one from that one tactic I employed earlier. So I capture the knight here. In addition to trading my bishop for a knight, I'm also doubling his pawns here. So his pawn structure is going to be totally screwed up. He's going to have one isolated pawn on the H file. He's going to have two doubled pawns here on the C on the uh, F file. And he's going to have, you know, another pawn island on this side of the board. So this is something that I don't mind whatsoever. So I'll go ahead and do that. And he captures, recaptures with his pawn. And I play knight f4 here. And I'm basically, we're, he has to take this knight um, with his knight. If he doesn't, I'm threatening taking this pawn here with a double attack and checking his king. And I'm also threatening knight to c2 here, forking the king and the rook. So, you know, this this is a, a lot of looming attacks on this, from coming from this knight move, so I'm basically forcing him to take. So we go ahead and trade those knights. And he castles, finally. Maybe uh, several moves a little bit too late there, but he finally gets it done. And I give him a quick deck. And at this point, I am trying to just finish my development of my pieces on this side of the board, get them into action, and close the game out. So, he plays bishop to c3. First thing I noticed, okay, he's not he's no longer defending this pawn, which I'm attacking. He's also opening up an avenue here for his rook. Right now, this isn't much of a threat because my king is actually defending the d8 square, but I'm... Um, I'd like to play it safe. That's kind of the way I play, and I'm already ahead, so just trying to watch out for potential checkmating threats. Obviously, since I have all these pawns here that haven't moved, um, back rank checkmate is a potential problem for my king. So I play knight to e7. I'm just opening up this uh, area for my rook to defend in case anything happens here later on in the game. And he plays rook to d2. So clearly, to, in my mind, he was just planning to double these rooks on this file. Again, this really isn't a threat because I have two defenders of this square now. So it's not a problem for me, but, you know, I'm playing extra safe. So, oh, not yet. guess I didn't play safe yet. What I did here was just recapture this hanging pawn. Um, because, again, there's no real threat to my king at this time. So now he doubles the rooks. And now I create this little square of breathing room for my king, just in case there's ever, ever a problem on this square. Okay, he plays pawn to e6. So obviously he's attacking this pawn, but he also opens up this diagonal for his bishop to attack my other undefended pawn. But here I'm already up uh, a piece and a pawn. I'm not super worried about losing a pawn or trading pawns or anything. So I just go ahead and take that e6 pawn. And he grabs my undefended pawn on g7. And I'm in fact giving up this extra pawn as well on h6. Um, I'm willing to give that up to create an open file for my rook here towards the end of the game. That was my thought process there. And he goes ahead and takes that pawn. And here we have another interesting position. So see if you guys can notice a, an attack that wins... Uh, this bishop for black here. So we already talked about a move that involves a check and a capture, and now this is all about the attack. So see if you can figure out a way to win this bishop for black, and I'll give you a few seconds.
Okay. So the thing to notice here, what I noticed after he made this move was the real lack of mobility for this white bishop on h6. He doesn't have that many squares to go to. I'm going to highlight the squares that he could possibly move to right now, and this is it. There's only five squares he can go. This rook that he has on d2 is actually blocking part of his bishop's escape path here. Um, so I've already noticed that. So just for these, or, sorry, these squares here are already covered by my rooks. Obviously, I'll have to move this rook, but my rook's are already covering these squares, and the only other square that his bishop can go to is already being attacked by my bishop. So the move I played here was rook to f6, attacking the bishop, and this bishop has nowhere to go. So it was here that my opponent just resigned the game after he realized that he could not move his bishop anywhere. Um, after this game was over, I, I did analyze it a bit, and I actually noticed that he could have played uh, pawn to b4 here. So basically, this would involve sacrificing a pawn instead of a bishop. So let's say he plays this. I'll have to recapture. And once he moves his rook here, attacking this bishop, let's say I move back. Well, now he has an avenue to basically escape with that bishop. But that's a pretty difficult move to say. I probably would not have seen that move. Um, and he already would have been up. He was already down a lot of material to begin with. Um, but yeah, I mean... This basically the end of the game. It was a pretty nasty attack. Um, so I guess that pretty much wraps up this game. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, my next video is going to be pretty interesting. I have a very unique puzzle to show you guys that I'm actually really excited about. So um, I hope you don't miss that one. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I'll see you guys next time.